healthcare funding. It is a notoriously complex subject, rather dry. I would imagine, as an economist, you love it. Yes, healthcare funding is not only complex, it is also crucial. Human lives are at stake, Simon, and there are ferocious arguments about how to pay for it. According to some studies, uh, famously the Commonwealth Fund, the NHS is the best value health service in the developed world. And according to others, it's among the worst. And of course, it's a field dominated by statistics. You're damn right I love it. <laughs> well, it's not just statistics, of course. For many, the principles of the NHS are literally dogma. We remain convinced it is the envy of the world, largely because it was the first universal healthcare system, in much the same way that the London Underground was the first subway system, which is probably why to this very day the Northern Line is the envy of the world too. <laughs> The closest thing we've had to a thorough debate on the NHS was presented through the medium of dance, choreographed by Danny Boyle as part of the 2012 opening ceremony. <laughs> In 1947, when the NHS was introduced as part of a raft of overtly communist measures brought in by Attlee to celebrate the defeat of the Nazis by Joseph Stalin, <laughs> it was safe to do so because the British people still had, broadly speaking, a sense of responsibility and self-respect. These qualities had just got them through a war and they would never have thought to trouble society at large with their own trivial complaints. They took care of themselves, what today would be called preventative medicine, but amounted then mainly to sitting up straight and scrubbing with proper soap. <laughs> Only in extreme medical emergencies could one dial 999. This was chosen as the number to call, fire, police or ambulance, as the number 9 took the longest to unwind on an old telephone dial and consequently gave you plenty of time to reconsider whether you really needed to waste everyone's time. Tim, I imagine this level of care was pretty damned affordable. Yes, it was. The entire budget for the National Health Service was initially less than £500 million a year, and that turned out to be more than enough to provide starched uniforms and keep varicose veins below internationally embarrassing levels. And half a billion, that would be what in today's prices? About £18 billion. And now? Well, by last year, the UK NHS budget had increased to £116 billion, which is almost seven times as much. Maybe you'd like to guess how we raised that £116 billion? I would say the bulk of it would be raised through the car parks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you... You might think that. Uh, no, 98.8% of that money comes from tax, and the other 1.2% comes from prescription charges, dentist fees and... Yeah, actually, yeah, car parks. But it is a huge amount of money. It's climbing every year. Climbing every year and climbing with a vigour and purpose its patients can only dream of. Because I have to say, we're spending seven times as much as we were in 1947. The British people don't seem to enjoy seven times better health, do they? This is the law of diminishing returns in action. Each extra pound you spend gets you less than the previous pound. So in healthcare, you start with the simple stuff. Stop crapping in the gutter, install a flush lavatory. If you're a doctor, wash your hands after dissecting corpses and before delivering babies. This stuff is fairly cheap and it makes a huge difference to people's health. But later, you're doing much more expensive stuff. And some of these treatments are medically miraculous. But you can get a lot of measles jabs for the price of a brain surgeon. Anyway, Simon, we are healthier. Life expectancy has increased, although I imagine that's mostly a reduction in the consumption of cigarettes and beef dripping. <laughs> healthier or not, very few people seem satisfied with the current level of service. So what should we do? Should we be spending more? Is it time for a troop surge? Or would we be throwing good money after bad? Tim, what proportion of the budget is the government spending on healthcare at present? Well, across developed nations such as ours, total healthcare budgets tend to amount to something between 9% and 12% of national income. And we currently spend 9.5%. So we'd need to spend an extra £30 billion to match Germany's spending, which is the highest in Europe. Yes, it's worth remembering Germany have no defence budget to speak of, being an occupied US puppet state. <laughs> No real Coast Guard to speak of either, for that matter. Well, quite so. America, meanwhile, due to its determination not to provide free health care to the less well-off, has managed to keep its costs down to just 18% of GDP, which is almost double what we spend. It truly is the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, more on America later, if only to make ourselves feel better. But, Tim... <laughs> 
let's say, in principle, we could find another 30 billion on the magic money tree. Would that bring us up to Teutonic levels of vitality, or would it simply extend a handful of tragically compromised lives by a few miserable machine-dependent months, <laughs> while millions more continue to trundle in and out of GP surgeries every week with a grim regularity which, due to their sedentary lifestyles and refined carbohydrate-based diets, their own bowels are no longer able to guarantee? <laughs> £30 billion pounds would help, but you know, who has that kind of money? That's reserved for the DUP and Brexit. We can't <laughs> spend that on the NHS. So really the challenge we have is to think about how best to spend the money that we do have. For example, if you believe that poor lifestyle choices are the problem, then perhaps that should be addressed first. Ah, yes. Conscription, yes. National service. <laughs> Spell in the army. What? Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of public awareness campaigns. I think rather than just awareness, we should actively influence behaviour. Uh, tax chips and sugary drinks and subsidised fruit and frisbees. Well, we... <laughs> We do that to some extent. We tax cigarettes, there's minimum alcohol pricing in Scotland. Although, there is an argument that we could go further. Well, let's look at the facts. Somebody did a study in Australia and they calculated that taxing foods high in salt and sugar and saturated fat and spending that money to subsidise fruit and veg, that would add almost 500,000 extra years of healthy life to Australia's population and it would save more than three billion Australian dollars. Well, that sounds like quite a lot, doesn't it? 500,000 extra years of healthy life? Sounds appropriately enough for Australia, like a no-brainer, I'd say. It does, but um, split over the entire population of 23 million Australians, that works out at roughly an extra week each, which is, yeah, it's enough time to... <laughs> to play a test match but not much else. It's interesting, isn't it, how it pans out. The battle with public health does seem to be a long and arduous one. In the UK, about two-thirds of adults are now overweight, with a quarter being fully obese. You compare this to France, where less than a sixth are obese, despite subsisting largely on croissant and cheese, <laughs> which, if nothing else, proves the cardiovascular benefits of extramarital sex. <laughs> By 2025, it's expected that obesity will cost wider society an estimated £37 billion a year. So you eliminate that, and we're right up in Germany's grill. Why aren't we doing more? I think the problem is that a lot of public health spending schemes can be counterintuitive and, and don't go down that well with the public. Providing incentives could be interpreted as rewarding bad behaviour rather than motivating good behaviour. I and mean, put simply, why should an overweight person get a free gym membership when someone who looks after their health has to pay Richard Branson 40 quid a month for the pleasure of getting a fungal infection from standing barefoot on a sort of wobbly flying saucer? So, what if you wanted to rid yourself of these pesky, obese bed blockers and make a break for it on your own? Apart from paying your national insurance, as usual, could you and should you invest in private health care? Does it count as a kind of bespoke personal preventative care? To answer that question and more, I spoke to Merrin Somerset Webb, editor-in-chief of Money Week, who's been keeping the nation's personal finances healthy for so long, it's surely about time we trusted her with our physical well-being too. Is it worth investing in your own preventative health care measures? Is this a good use of your time and energy? What do you mean preventative health care measures? Well, I suppose... Buying probiotics? Yes, joining the gym, <laughs> having uh, home gym equipment, having regular blood work, as the Americans call it. I think, you know, just blood tests, you know, monitoring your health. Is it something we're becoming overly obsessed with? Or is no, it actually a good absolutely use? not. Very important for, um, you know, the economy that everyone buys gym equipment that they don't use at home. Yeah. Very important for the economy that everyone buys a gym membership that they don't Use. You've so got a, is, one of those rowing machines with yeah, uh, with a with a sort of not, not like mini ocean in it. <laughs> I've seen yes, it. Yes, I have, and I've used it once. Yeah, and a very beautiful piece of equipment. It is, it is well, lovely, is sort well. of absolutely lovely. burnished wood. Mm. Mm. See, this is the trouble with healthcare. It's so boring. Within seconds of talking to Marion, we've already got distracted by the wood finish on certain brands of rowing machine. <laughs> <coughs> Trying to drag the subject back, I asked whether we should buy health insurance. One thing I would say about health insurance is that, you know, in the main, people tend to think that if they're going to use private health care, they should have annual health insurance, which is incredibly expensive unless you're getting mm. it by your company, in which case you might as well have it. But yeah. you may well be much better off doing what we call self-insuring, which is simply putting aside every year the amount of money that you would spend on health insurance so that you have your own private insurance account. And then, let's say, when you get to whatever age it is and you need a knee replacement, you can withdraw from your own personal insurance account the 10 okay. grand you require and get it done at the spire. 
Oh, if you're feeling brave, there are a number of struck-off backstreet surgeons who'll do it for the price of a ham roll. <laughs> and you can spend your self-insurance budget on a lovely wood-finished rowing machine. Anyway, finally, I asked Merrin the all-important question of whether we can make money out of the obesity crisis. If you want to invest in obesity, you need to be investing in diabetes, right. obviously. Yeah. Um, so you need to be looking for the companies that are making the new diabetes drugs or making the, the medical devices that help people with diabetes. So Big pharma, pharma, medical devices, biotech, etc. Are they a good bet, do you think? I mean, traditionally, they're sort of blue chip, aren't they, I suppose? Mm, they're mm. just sort of and solid and stable. And lots of the big pharma companies, they're not, not particularly expensive. Lots of them are doing very interesting things. Um, so, yeah, those are, those are reasonable places to have long-term money invested. So, yeah, that's a core cool part of a modern portfolio should be something that invests in the healthcare area. So there you have it. As a modern prospector would no doubt say, there's gold in them, their obesity-related metabolic syndromes. <laughs> so, back to some more cold, hard figures, Tim. Not on the cryogenics ward. The NHS needs to buy drugs. So who exactly decides how much these drugs cost? There's a process of negotiating deals between the drug companies and the NHS. And drugs fall into two categories. There are those that are under patent protection, so-called brand name, and those that aren't, so-called generic. For example, sildenafil is the generic name of a medicine used to treat erectile dysfunction. But the company that makes sildenafil, Pfizer, sells it under the brand name Viagra. Sildenafil. <laughs> OK. So that's a bit like the difference between Kellogg's Cocoa Pops with Coco the Monkey on the front and supermarket own brand Choco Crispies with Alvin the Choco Hippo. <laughs> it's sort of like that, but imagine if after Kellogg invented Cocoa Pops, no one else could make a similar cereal for 20 years, which is the typical length of a patent for drugs. This means that during that period, the drug company can charge whatever it likes because no one else is allowed to manufacture it. After the patent expires, the market opens up and generic, cheaper versions of the drug can be produced. Why do we have this system which keeps new drugs expensive? Well, the argument has always been that the more profitable new drugs are, the more incentive a company has to invent them. So without the opportunity to make money, it might be that companies wouldn't be driven to develop new drugs and would still be licking willow trees and eating nettles. Right, but not everyone agrees agrees with that, right? Well, it's certainly up for argument. Not all patented drugs are particularly innovative. For example, Pristique is a high-cost brand name antidepressant, which is still under patent. Effexor is an old, dirt-cheap generic equivalent. And the difference between the two drugs is molecularly minuscule. Yet Pristique is the second most prescribed antidepressant in the USA, and Effexor isn't. And is this possibly in any way influenced by doctors having free days out at golf courses with alluring and potentially buxom pharmaceutical harpies? I <laughs> couldn't possibly say, but a recent study shows that doctors who often eat drug company-sponsored free lunches are more than twice as likely to prescribe Pristique as doctors who rarely eat such lunches. Hmm. There's also the story of EpiPen, a delivery system for a synthetic dose of adrenaline that can be self-administered in the event of an anaphylactic shock, such as someone with a nut allergy ignoring the may-contain-nuts warning on a packet of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> the EpiPen, despite looking like one of those fat biros that has 12 different colours in it and you throw it away when the blue runs out... <laughs> of these reached a price of over $600 in the US. Now, the point is, the drug inside is entirely generic. It costs, for want of a less insensitive metaphor, peanuts. It's, <laughs> it's all about the pen. So where are the EpiPen knockoffs? Well, funnily enough, in the UK, we have loads and it keeps the cost down. But in America, they've all been rejected by the Food and Drug Administration. Who knows why? Could it be the million dollars that the owners of EpiPen spend on lobbying per year? I'm not saying it's definitely related, but yes. <laughs> Before we move on to discussing how the NHS actually decides which drugs to buy, let's talk to Tamandra Harkness about how the NHS is currently using our data and how they might use it in the future to turn a profit. Tamandra, as we've discussed in the previous three episodes, data is power. Data is increasingly important and central to the way we live. Could it save the NHS? There's a lot that it could do to help patients... A lot of treatments could be improved by better research using lots of data. There's an experiment with wearables in Manchester where people who've had heart problems will wear a, a wearable like a smartwatch and it will monitor their heart rate. And if it goes a bit funny, then the doctor can call them back in. It's a bit like kind of Amazon for your heart rate. Mm. Patients who previously displayed these patterns of heartbeat <laughs> went on to die. <laughs> 
I mean, has there been much polling? Do we know how people feel about this kind of thing? When they asked us a couple of years ago, are you happy for all your data to go on a big computer and we'll decide who gets access to it? A lot of people said, no, no, we're not happy because you might let other people have access to it that we don't necessarily approve of. All those embarrassing vacuum cleaner related incidents <laughs> as well. I wasn't going to raise it if you didn't, Simon. <laughs> You can see how the data the NHS has is immensely valuable for research because it's quite unique and it has the health records of most of the population. That's fantastic. If you wanted to research what's the difference between the health outcomes of men who'd never taken sildenafil and men who suddenly discovered its existence during their radio programme and proceeded <laughs> to take it for the next 10 years, and you can see that would be really useful information to health researchers, to pharmaceutical companies, to insurance companies. Yeah. <laughs> now, obviously, the most, imp well, I say obviously, but I think it is widely accepted, the most troublesome area going forward for the NHS is, or even to the extent that it is the NHS's social care, looking after the elderly in particular. And here, I think, is where sex robots really can make a difference, because... <laughs> Seriously, let's call them androids then for the time being, nandroids. They are capable of working 24 hours a day. Machine learning now is quite quick to recognise a patient's basic needs and they're probably capable, to be absolutely honest with you, of dealing with a lot of troublesome elderly patients with a lot more evident empathy than the current human specimens that they're exposed to. <laughs> To crop up on Panorama with hideous regularity. So There are already uh, robot nurses, not so much here, but certainly in Asia, where they have more of an ageing population and a labour shortage. Things like robots that can help lift heavy patients so that nurses don't constantly have to go off work with a bad back. Mm. So all those things, I think, are helpful. The sex robots, I mean, maybe you've read the Kerfilly study, which showed a very distinct correlation between living longer and having more orgasms in a week. I mean, if you want preventative medicine... And that was named after medicine. crumbly cheese for some reason, was it? That's interesting. <laughs> the Care Philly study. The Care Philly study, yes. Okay. They did it very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> and there was you disparaging that generic Viagra a minute ago, and it sounds like it could be a lifesaver. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Amanda Harkness, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Tim, like a slightly bored dinner party host, I am going to usher you back towards drugs now. <laughs> We've discussed how we can't afford unlimited amounts of all of them, so how does the NHS decide which ones they are going to buy? In England and Wales, we have a thing called NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Scotland and Northern Ireland are officially independent, but largely they end up muttering to themselves and then following NICE's recommendations. Now, to judge whether a given intervention offers value for money, NICE use a thing called a QALY, and a QALY stands for Quality Adjusted Life Year, and it's a scoring system for what a drug or therapy is likely to offer. Essentially, a year lived in perfect health, regardless of other sources of disappointment and irritation, is allocated a score of one, and a year of being dead is allocated a score of zero. <laughs> and, I mean, most other years are scored somewhere between those two. <laughs> most other years. Well, yeah, actually, NICE does acknowledge the possibility of negative qualities, years in which you would literally have been better off dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know how to refer to those in future. When you're in terrible pain, they've switched off the drip, the TV remote doesn't work and the nurse has left loose women on. <laughs> So, how much is it suggested that one of these qualies is worth, Tim? Well, generally, anything less than £20,000 per quali is deemed cost-effective. Between £20,000 and £30,000 is a maybe, and, to be honest, anything more than £30,000 to deliver one measly quali, it's really a no-go from then on. You're on your own, or possibly you're on the one show. <laughs> So that's the British system, and much like our Eurovision entries, our football teams, our Navy and our state broadcasting service, we tend to think that ours is the best. That the rest of the world just have a few random doctors and hospitals strewn about the place in much the same way that we have florists, or perhaps those architects that specialise in kitchen extensions. Yeah, this <laughs> still seem to be the national delusion. The vast majority of other developed nations now adopt the principle that healthcare should be available to all, regardless of ability to pay, and in some studies, whisper it, in some studies, 
those countries outperform the National Health Service by quite a margin. <laughs> Wash your mouth out. Now, <laughs> joining me to discuss whether other countries in the world present a viable alternative to the NHS, would you please welcome Dr Christian Nemitz of the Institute of Economic Affairs. <laughs> Dr Nemitz, thank you very much for joining us. Could you explain in simple terms all the other systems that operate <laughs> around the world. Just that broadly old. speaking, broad brushstrokes, what are the other main healthcare system options that mm. we could conceivably adopt? Well, the main alternative would be the social health insurance system, which uh, in Western Europe covers well over 100 million people. That is essentially a system of universal insurance, where the government makes sure that everybody is covered, so if you can't afford your health insurance premium, if you lose your job or whatever, the government would pay it for you. And in that way, they make sure that there is no such thing as an uninsured population like in the States. And uh, the second major thing about them is that in those systems, health insurers are not allowed to discriminate against anyone on the basis of health status. So an insurer couldn't say, we don't want to insure you, you're not profitable, you have uh, pre-existing conditions or whatever. They have to accept everybody. And uh, that means those systems are not pure free market systems. The government does have a role to play, but uh, it's a much more limited role than here. The government is not itself a major healthcare provider or it doesn't directly fund most healthcare. You preserve the good bits of a market system, which is that you have freedom of choice and competition. So individuals under those systems, do they tend to have a wide range of levels of policy or do they tend to cluster around something approximating to the amount we spend anyway on the NHS? Yeah, that, that depends on what exact system we're, we're looking at. Uh, some of them have a broader range of choices. So in, in the Swiss system in particular, there are big differences because you can choose how much freedom of choice you want to have. So would you say if you were to put, if you were, you know, gun to your head, which I suppose would be, un, you know, not the ideal way of settling it, but <laughs> if you were to choose one, the Swiss one would be the one? Yes. Why do you think then, the, the British women, whenever it comes up that we might engage with the free market at all in terms of healthcare, it's always immediately the American system, which we point out as being the disaster is, is that just habit? That's just because it's an easy target. Uh, the US system has a number of major flaws and, and those flaws are very well known. So that means that's an easy way to score rhetorical points to refer to that system. It's also a, an irrelevant target because nobody wants to introduce the American system. As far as I'm aware, there's not a single person in Britain who advocates that system. And even if you could find some crackpot who does, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's really an irrelevant comparison. But, but it's man. a very easy one. It is a, a straw man, but an effective one. Because American healthcare, that sounds kind of scary. Whereas if you say Swiss healthcare, does Dutch healthcare, that doesn't sound... Swiss healthcare has... Mm -hmm. uh, there's a slight <laughs> overtone. <laughs> well, okay. I think that's un unfair. <laughs> There does seem to be an extraordinary sentimental attachment to the NHS in this country. Do other nations feel the same about their healthcare system or are they more detached and objective about it? Yes, I think this is a specialty uh, that, that you only get here. But that, that has to do with the fact that there is a single organisation that you can attach that sentimentality to. I would struggle to imagine how a Swiss equivalent or a Dutch equivalent of this Olympic ceremony would look like. Would they yeah. dance around an acronym of, of their, their health insurance company? <laughs> or, you know? Fantastic. Dr Nemis, thank you very much. For <laughs> what the end game might be is now a serious and troubling question. An ageing population is now able to be kept technically alive for many times longer beyond economic usefulness than used to be the case. By 2039, the number of over 85s is estimated to more than double to 3.5 million. And even now, an 85-year-old man costs the NHS about seven times more on average than a man in his late 30s, largely because it takes a lot of electricity to turn a telly up that loud. <laughs> Meanwhile, many astonishing interventions are now possible that are so expensive they can only be funded by celebrity telethons on a case-by-case -case basis. Consequently, it is broadly expected that health concerns will entirely overwhelm the country by 2040, and anyone not presently in the care of the NHS will either be working for it or paying their entire tax burden towards its upkeep. Or maybe the cycle will reset itself and we'll go back to a situation where, when you get ill and old, you'll be left on a hillside by your family and you walk into the woods never to return. 
beats dying on a trolley when someone casually unplugs you to plug in the vending machine because they want a Yorkie. <laughs> On that uplifting note, what have we learned? The NHS needs out-of-the-box thinking to modernise the way it works. For example, one way might be to rebrand NHS hospitals as an MRSA experience. <laughs> one of the best healthcare systems in Europe is the Dutch style, which is where you share the cost of your healthcare 50-50 with your girlfriend. <laughs> We tend to think that Americans have no interest in our health system, but we forget that the Beach Boys reached number one in the US with a song debating who should determine drug spending in the NHS with their hit, Wouldn't It Be Nice? <laughs> You've been listening to Simon Evans Goes to Market. Good night. <laughs> You've been listening to Simon Evans Goes to Market with me, Simon Evans, Tim Harford, Merrin Somerset-Webb, Amanda Harkness and Dr Christian Nemitz. The show was written by me with Benjamin Partridge, the researcher was Andrew Wright and the producer was Richard Morris. It was a BBC Studios production.